Hello, this is Rudy Giuliani, and I'm back with another episode of Rudy's Common Sense. Today, we're going to follow up on our discussion of the election a few days ago. We've now had a few more days to consider the impact of the election. And there's one uh, thing that comes out of it that uh, I think we should seize on immediately and go full speed ahead. I think the opportunity is there now because of the opening that's taken place with uh, far greater knowledge of the very, very uh, insufficient performance of our public school systems to teach our children uh, in the way they should be taught. Uh, To have America in the 30th position, 40th position, 45th position on reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, to have great deficiencies in the teaching of history and geography and in comparison to other nations is, is, uh, first of all, just indecent and uh, indefensible with regard to our caring for our children. Number two, it puts America in a tremendously uh, uh, difficult position with regard to competition in the future. And may, may I just say something to those of you who have the means to put your children in, uh, in school situations that are excellent, whether they be uh, parochial, private, homeschooling, or excellent public schools that can be found. You've got a big, big stake in all the rest of the children being educated properly because um, it's just not about your child or their friends. This nation succeeds or fails based on the educational level, the competency level, the work ethic, the patriotism of most of our citizens, not just a few of the uh, privileged ones. So sometimes um, a parental choice, vouchers, things of that nature are very popular in, uh, and are very popular among minority groups. And when you go to America's suburbs, they're they're not nearly as popular because there are good schools there. That's changing somewhat, but that used to be the case. Well, you're being very short-sighted, those of you who don't support it because you have the luxury of good schools, because your children are going to grow up in an America that's determined not just by their education, but by the education of the vast majority of children in America. And America with a well-educated workforce, with a committed workforce, with a patriotic workforce, is going to be a much more successful America for your children. And, and the opposite is also the case. So this is an issue for all of us. And the issue that I'm talking about is really the civil rights issue of this century. And that's parental choice in education. Uh, What I said to you, I've been saying for 30 years, maybe. I'm certainly not the only one to say it. Those words have been used by others. This is the civil rights issue of the present century. I believe former President Bush used those words, and I think President Trump has used those words, and I think Newt Gingrich has used those words. And There have been great attempts to move forward on parental choice, and some states have gone quite far. We're way further ahead than where we were when I first started saying this back in the the 1990s. But let me tell you my, my story of how I became convinced that this may be one of the most necessary things we do if we are going to fulfill our promise to our children to give them the opportunity for a good education which we are now grossly negligent in doing. So uh, when, I, um, when I became mayor of New York City, I was um, nominally in charge of the largest public school system in the country. Uh, it then had over one million children. Recent events have shown a large decline under Mayor de Blasio in the school system. And they're down below a million, and the uh, parochial, private, and homeschooling has grown. But it was over a million when I was the mayor. And my first impact, uh, fir- first impulse was to try to do everything I could to improve the, the public school system uh, before I made a choice on whether I would support 
uh, vouchers, uh, um, uh, pro-choice uh, uh, scholarship programs, although I was always partial to them. Having been myself the product of a parochial education, I knew, I knew the benefits of it. Um, I knew them instinctually. I didn't need statistics to, to show me. But um, the first year or so, I tried very, very hard to get the public school system to embrace things like accountability. Let's measure the performance of teachers so that we can pay the good teachers more than the average teachers and pay the average teachers more than the bad teachers and try to move the bad teachers out. I was told by then Randy Weingarten, who was head of the New York City Union, uh, now the National Union, uh, that, that you could not measure the performance of teachers. Well, of course, that's absurd. I mean, you can measure the performance of anyone. It's never exact. It's never perfect. A batting average doesn't tell you everything about a, about a player, but it gives you a snapshot, right? And having some ability to evaluate is better than having none. And uh, there's no question that the union had slipped into defending the worst teachers, whether worst teachers in terms of performance, because they would argue for everyone being paid the same, or even the worst teachers in terms of behavior, because they made it almost impossible to quickly remove teachers who had uh, done uh, bad things, whether that be physical violence with the children uh, or sexual uh, predators. Now, New York City uh, has had this scandal for some time. They call it the rubber rooms. Uh, teachers are, uh, are put in these places where, while they're going through the almost endless disciplinary process, they're sent to a school where they don't teach, but they're paid a full salary. I short-circuited that by giving those cases to district attorneys, and they would be in prison before the, before the mandated uh, bargain for situation with the uh, union was worked out. I'd have the indignity of having to send them checks at Sing Sing, but at least they weren't near, near our children or in our neighborhoods. And that's when I learned that the teachers union was about representing the worst teachers and did nothing for the best teachers. And uh, that it was impossible to get them to move on even minor issues like some accountability, some merit pay, uh, some ability to look at a failing school and really make major changes in personnel, which is the only way you change a failing operation. If you can't change personnel, it's just going to stay that way for 20 or 30 years. And some of the schools in the school system stayed that way for 20 or 30 years. The problem that I had was I was not in control of the school system, really. The school system was controlled by a then Board of Education with seven members, only two of whom I appointed. The others were appointed by borough president, four of whom were Democrats and one of whom was a Republican. So almost every vote where there was contention, it went down four to three. Um, I did make some changes. I introduced art education into the schools. I uh, increased the uh, uh, sports uh, programs. Uh, I was able to uh, negotiate uh, the end of lockstep uh, appointment of uh, principals. Principals were appointed on merit. Uh, as soon as principals got appointed on merit, they moved very, very quickly to want to try to get teachers appointed on merit. Now, let me go back, take out the principal part. We worked very hard to get superintendents appointed by, on merit. Eventually, we were able to do that. When we were able to do that, uh, the superintendents became the biggest advocates of evaluating the principals and the teachers on merit. Uh, because in order for them to be successful, they needed some management tools to fix the failing schools. The school uh, board and the teachers union, school board really controlled by the teachers union, at least the four Democrats, as is the entire Democrat Party, uh, opposed that bitterly, strongly, viciously. Hmm. All of a sudden, uh, in about the, um, oh, somewhere in the 1990s, and I, I don't like to use um, uh, statistics all, all the time because I think you don't need uh, s statistics. This is a good time to take a break. How much equity do you have in your home? 50,000, 100,000, more? Cybercrime experts are alerting homeowners that the more equity you have, 
the greater the chance foreign and domestic criminals will come after you. Title theft is one of the fastest growing crimes. Home Title Lock, America's leader in home title protection, is alerting homeowners. They could already be a victim and not know it. Here's how it goes down. First, cyber thieves search hundreds of public databases for high equity homes. Next, they pull your home's title that's online. They forge your signature stating you sold your home and they take out loans using your equity. You're not covered by insurance. Your bank or common identity theft programs protect your most valuable asset. Register your address now to see if you're already a victim and receive a complete title history of your home, a $100 value free. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. That's HomeTitleLock.com. Thank you for returning. For me, I didn't need uh, statistics to uh, show, well, statistics or academic studies to show me the benefit of parochial, private, uh, charter, uh, homeschooling alternatives, both from the point of view of creating competition and giving us other, mo- and giving us models of excellence in education. I knew that from my own experience. Uh, but of course, not everyone in the city knew that. And in the mid 90s, actually, I think it was 1997, uh, but, it, but it really st- started, the fundraising really started in the mid 90s, a group of very concerned citizens got together and raised a great deal of money and established the School Choice Scholarship Foundation. And just, and it, it, it was a complicated, large, large program, and I have all kinds of reports here on it. But uh, let me see if I can simplify it. So the, the purpose of it was to offer scholarships to parents in, who have children in public school who would like the opportunity for a uh, private education, in most cases, a parochial education, because that would be a, 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 a tuition level that would fit better the scholarships. And um, when they finally organized it, it took a few years, in 1997, I believe, they uh, offered 1,300 of those scholarships to New York City public school students between K and fourth grade. And uh, when we got that offer, I was quite, I was quite ex- uh, excited because um, I said, well, you know, this will be, I think, viewed very favorably by the board. I thought the teachers would oppose it because the teachers' union opposed Not the teachers. The teachers' union opposes everything. Uh, but I thought the board would embrace this because here, here are, here are, here's some opportunity to test out all the parochial, the private schools better. Do they have some things that we can borrow? Uh, competition is always good. It's you know, improved at public schools. It all made sense to me. I didn't need to be convinced. And uh, I went to the school board and, and said, let's distribute the applications since we only have 1,300 scholarships and we're going to probably have more parents than that that are going to want it. Let's make sure they're equally available to all parents. Uh, and let's, why don't we distribute them in the schools? Well, the school board said no. Now, you'd be surprised to know that I didn't, again, I said, control the school board. Uh, I only had two votes. I just voted down, as I often was. And um, so I thought this was terribly unfair. So I utilized every other device that I had available to get those applications to, um, to students. I used other agencies of government to distribute them. I used my uh, monthly town hall meetings to do it. If you came to one of my town hall me- meetings, I would give you numerous uh, applications so that you would give it out to people. I used my visits to uh, the, uh, the boroughs, which I did quite frequently. I was not a sedentary mayor. I moved around the city. And I made sure I spent equal amount of time in the other boroughs or counties of the city, which often feel neglected. I held, I held my cabinet meeting once a month in a different borough. I had a town hall meeting once a month. Uh, I think I had 97 of them. Missed one in November of 2001. And then I doubled up in December. I guess I was an obsessive compulsive. I don't know. But I enjoyed the town hall meeting because I was educated. And I brought all of my... Uh, I brought all of my commissioners to it so that they would hear the complaints of people firsthand and solve them right there. And I would say a third of the issues at the town hall meetings, the 92 of them, involved schools. 
and dissatisfaction with what was a failing school system and a moral failure to provide our children with even a basic, decent education. It's something that I was ashamed of, and I think any decent person would be ashamed of it. And the, the, the thing that held us back from doing it was the political hold that the teachers union had on the Democrat Party, which is unholy and corrupt and enormously harmful to the children of my city, particularly, but to the children of America as well. But naively, I thought the school board would, would help me uh, distribute these applications. What the heck? They were going to take 1,300 students, uh, be 1,300 less for an already overcrowded school system. A little competition could never hurt. May turn out to work, may turn out not to work, but couldn't be much worse than what we were doing. Here we were, you know, down in the 28th in literature or English and 41st in math and 45th in science and, you know, small little countries doing better than us. How could we, uh, how could it be any worse? Plus, we had this terrible uh, problem of crime in, in our schools. Uh, a lot of crime. In our, I, I had to put police in the, uh, in, the school, in the school buildings. The Board of Education opposed that also. But since it was a police matter, I said, screw you. I just did it. What, are you going to throw, throw my police out? Try that. See, my police were not like the left-wing police that get water thrown on them. Mayors tolerate that. I give up uh, 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 police stations. I mean, under a de Blasio or one of these progressive Democrat mayors, gosh, if the school board said, no, we're not going to let teachers in, they said, oh, fine, fine. And I said, look, you don't police the city, I do. You teach, I take care of people's safety. If you took care of people's safety, it'd be a disaster. And it is a disaster in my schools. You've got too many drugs in schools. you got too many weapons in lockers. You've got too many drug dealers hanging around the schools. We set up drug free, free zones around the schools. We caught you there, you got a heavier penalty. And we did extra policing around the schools to get the, hell, get the, get the drug dealers the hell out of there. Uh, so I had done a lot to really try to help the schools. And I thought, my goodness, this scholarship program, they all care about the kids as much as I do. I mean, I know the teachers union is corrupt and uncaring. A lot of the teachers are, are disgusted with it, particularly the good ones. That's why they leave. They get demoralized. They're not represented. But I thought, my goodness, the school board. And then we got voted down. You know, they, they, didn't want, they didn't want to give out the material. They didn't even want the parents to learn about the option. I think they, they knew better than I did what was going to happen. This would be a good time to take a pause. I accomplished a lot in 2020 exposing the truth establishing the relationship with you, working tirelessly for America. And I came to know the work and value of the people at American Hartford Gold. You see, you buy gold not only for what you know, but you buy gold for what you don't know. American Hartford Gold is the company you can trust when it comes to buying gold. They sell physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside of your IRA. In the precious metals industry, they are the highest rated firm in our country with an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied clients. Give them a call and tell them Rudy sent you. And be sure to ask them what I bought. And if you call them right now, they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver on your first order. Folks, these are uncertain times. The one thing you can count on to protect what you have worked so hard for is physical gold and silver. So don't wait. Call them now. Call 833-GOLD-777. That's 833-GOLD-777. Or text RUDY to 65532. Again, that's 833-GOLD-777. Or text RUDY to 65532. Let's continue. So, uh, not being one to ever just take a first uh, a no for an answer, I found other ways to get that, uh, those applications in the hands of the parents. I used other city agencies. 
I used volunteer groups. I used churches. And I used my town hall meetings and I used my cabinet meetings to do the same. So by the time we got to uh, application time and we helped them with applications, I think most of the parents, if not all of the parents that would have been in that K through four category were able to get their hands on an application. And there was another, there was another uh, part to this that made it very interesting. Yes, they would get a scholarship, but the parents had to pay some of the, some of the tuition. And that was required for the purpose of making sure the parents were involved. Because one of the great lacks, one of the great failings pointed out in numerous reports from all different sides of the political spectrum concerning our failing public school education, then and now, is lack of parental involvement in the public schools, which comes as a real ironic twist on what Terry McAuliffe and the Democratic Party stands for now, which is that the parents shouldn't be involved in education. I would say almost every expert on how to improve the education of poor children in particular in, um, in uh, the failing public schools, or to improve the education of any child in any school is more parental involvement, not less. And what the public schools do through the excessively bureaucratic boards, bureaucrats, fascist organized teachers union, they push the parents out because they don't want interference. I told you, they don't want accountability. They don't want to be measured. They can't be measured. You can't measure teaching. You can't tell the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher. You can tell the difference between a good cop and a bad cop. You can tell the difference between a good sanitation worker and a bad sanitation. You can tell them between a good lawyer and a bad lawyer, a good doctor and a bad doctor, but you can't tell the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher. How about one that's been teaching 20 years and the graduation rate has never been you know, greater than 30%? I think that's a bad teacher. I think so. Think you can measure that? You're damn right you can. That's who the school uh, uh, unions are representing. That's why they are lowering the bar. So we, we go down to representing the mediocre, then we go down to representing the deficient, and over time, the excellent leave. Because there's no place for them. I, uh, unless you're truly a saint, and there are some that are, if you overperform, you want to be recognized for it. I mean, you'd like to be recognized with more money, or at least just recognized for it. Here you're not. I mean, the, the school union spends most of its time representing the highly deficient teachers, making sure they remain on the payroll as long as possible, even if they sexually molest a child. What do you think that does to the mindset of the parents with regard to how they think about the teacher's union and the teacher. What do you think happens to the parent when they're pushed out of the system and any attempt to try to find out what's going on in school is rejected by the highly possessive school apparatchiks and teachers and unions? So I said, oh gosh, the fact that the parent's gonna pay something here, that's a good idea, it gets the parent involved. Well. By that time, I had concluded that what I was dealing with with the Board of Education and subsequent events have made this so apparent, I wasn't dealing with a school system. I was dealing with a job protection system. Nobody in the Board of Education really cared that much about the children. There was very little discussion about how to improve their education. There was a lot of discussion about how to protect the jobs how to create more bureaucratic jobs, how to create jobs with better pay, how to get more days off, how to protect uh, the deficient people. A lot, of, a lot of discussion about that. That's what a whole debate was about. It, it, the Board of Education of New York, and I would say this is largely true of most urban, old, corrupt cities, was a job protection system for the people in the system protect the jobs of the teachers, the bureaucrats, the executives, the board. It's all, all part of the 
let's call it the education industry, public education industry, which is uh, highly bureaucratic, more bureaucrats than teachers, more bureaucrats than you need, tremendous wasted administrative money, and uh, tremendous protection for the prerogatives of the employees, and almost none for the children. I mean, it's very common in New York to say that everybody is represented in the school system. Everybody has a lobbyist or a representative. You know, the teachers have the powerful union, the superintendents have the association, others have lobbyists. The only group not represented in the school system are the children. They are virtually unrepresented and rarely thought about. And this experience solidified that for me because they couldn't accept the slightest bit of competition that might be good for the children. So what happened? And this is what really, really uh, turned me around in 1997, 1998. And from that time on, I've been a fierce, uh, dedicated proponent of, I don't know, call what you want, vouchers, scholarships, parental choice, charter schools, alternatives to public education, private schools, homeschooling, anything that will create competition for a moribund, failing, and tired old system that's ruining the lives of millions of our children. So here's what happened. 1,300, 1,300 slots, 20,000 applications. So they did a lottery and they picked the 1,300 and 1,300 went on to go into the uh, private and, and parochial schools and that left behind 18,700 students. 18,700 parents who were crying out for help for their children. And our Board of Education said, go to hell. 18,700 who were saying, depends on what the problem was, but those were, here's what the problems in those days. I'm dissatisfied with a educational system in which the graduation rate is less than 50%. Uh, when we compare ourselves to other countries where at best in the middle, we don't teach reading, writing, and arithmetic effectively. We used to be the best school system in the country, if not in the world, and now we're anywhere from 29th to 45th, uh, that we're falling behind in everything. And therefore, I want my child to get a better chance in life then you're providing them with this inadequate, failing, almost ludicrous education. Or the parents might also be concerned about the serious crime problems in the public schools. It wasn't unusual for public schools, even in the K through 12 category, to have children with knives, weapons, the children having drugs. And if the children didn't have it, the area around the school was uh, open, open ground for, for neighborhood drug dealers. And drugs therefore found their way into most of the schools. Uh, violence, common, fighting common, and uh, teachers unable to uh, very often deal with it. And the uh, board wouldn't allow, oh my goodness, you, you can't allow police in a school that might interfere with learning. Huh? Like stabbing somebody doesn't interfere with learning. Do you see the lack of common sense? If not the, 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 the desire to keep everybody out so they don't find out how bad things are? Or, or, uh, or there, might be, uh, there might be concern about, even back then, the agenda that was beginning to emerge. Uh, you know, Heather has two mommies and... Uh, 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 Ralphie has two fathers and uh, education about homosexuality, education about not so much about transgender <coughs> and also distribution of condoms. This wasn't necessarily opposed 
particularly the education about homosexuality, but it was being done without parental permission. And uh, then, then there was a parental opt-out that they bargained for, but the parent would have to find out about it. And, and the school did everything it could not to notify the parent. Because one of the things that has been universal for 30 years that broke out into the open as a major national problem uh, with the election in Virginia is the, the, the school boards, the teachers by and large, not all of them, but the bad ones, but the teachers as a group, the school boards for sure, treat the parents as unnecessary annoyances. And they don't want to let them into the schools because they know what they're going to find. They're going to find lockers with drugs. They're going to find children with knives. They're going to find there's an excessive amount of violence that goes on. And they're going to find out that their kids aren't learning very much. And then they're going to find out that many of these schools have their own ideas about the sexual education of children K through 12, children as early as seven and eight and nine. And this, this issue about Heather has two mommies and whatever got resolved based on parental consent. And it kind of settled down. Uh, but it was sort of a forerunner of the now uh, what I call uh, questioning gender programs, which uh, have emerged over the last, oh, really going back about seven or eight years with some of it being subcontracted to highly radical groups that begin questioning children at seven and eight about whether they're sure about their gender, and then we'll give them advice on how they can do hormone therapy. And it's written right into the uh, 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 books and, and, and literature of these groups that if a parent, if the child says the parent will not be uh, favorable to this, that you're entitled to conceal it from the parent. I mean, when parents found this out, that, that, that's going to going to lead to a revolution. But getting back to this program that, that, that was my epiphany, um, here we had 18,700 parents crying out for an alternative. And my city was saying to them, go, go to hell. You're not going to have an alternative. You got to stick with the school where you're afraid your kid might get killed, where you know your kid isn't being educated where you know you have no voice because they don't listen to you. And that's when I became a, uh, that's when I became a staunch, rabid supporter of school choice. Now, before we get to the conclusion and the, and the, um, and the uh, things we can do about it, let's take a short break. Not long ago, Mike Lindell, the inventor of MyPillow, and his team fit me for my very own MyPillow. They also introduced me to their wide assortment of other incredible products, like their mattress topper, their sheets, towels, slippers, and more. Sleep is incredibly important to me, and I can assume for all of you. It's time you give my pillow a try and see for yourself. Listeners have helped build my pillow into the incredible company it is today, and Mike Lindell wants to give back to all of you. You can get great discounts on my pillow products by going to MyPillow.com right now and seeing each of the specially priced items, including those in the radio listener special square. You're going to see rotational offers up to 66% off on products like their pillows, mattress topper, Giza sheets, but also new products like their slippers, weighted blankets, robes, and waffle blankets. All my pillow products come with a 60 day money back guarantee. Enter promo code Rudy for these great specials. That's mypillow.com and use the promo code Rudy. Welcome back. I told you I wasn't going to burden you with statistics because I've done programs on school choice, you know, for 20, 20, 25 years, and I'm always filled with statistics. I have a, I have a report here. Let me see if I can put my hands on it. I have a report here, for example, of this system. Here, just take a look at this. I mean, this is the kind of thing you'd have to be willing to go through. This is just a, an interim report on the school scholarship program with the tables and 
whole other ways to analyze it in the bibliography. I must have about 50 of these in different parts of the country because since the time of this program, school choice and uh, scholarship programs and uh, various forms of it, either through tax relief or direct payment for scholarships or uh, have become much more common in the United States in many states. Of course, the Democrat control states, which means the teacher union control states, have very little of this, if any. Uh, the best we can do in New York is charter schools, and there are perennial attempts, first by Mayor de Blasio, and then uh, after a while from Governor Cuomo when he decided to go left to not grow that program. That's the program I started, and Mayor Bloom Bloomberg really expanded, and then it got held up and eaten away at by socialist communist de Blasio because it's part of the socialist communist program to consign our children to terrible education so that they can take over the educational system and train them to be good socialists and take them away from you, the parent, at about two years old. Did you ever read Black Lives Matter? Did you ever read Marx? Did you ever read some of the current scholars on education? Much better to get those kids away from you, the parents, at about two and start indoctrinating them. That's what you're looking at. So this is a quick little analysis of the program after the first three years. And it's, it's very, very simple. They looked at uh, the test scores and they compared the kids, the kids that remained in the public school to the kids that went to the parochial and the private schools. And they found very little impact for the Latino students. The ones that remained in the public school did about as well as the ones that went to the parochial and the private school. But they found an amazing difference, an amazing difference, a significant difference in the performance of African-American students. The first year was a 5.5% increase. The second year was a 7.6% increase. And the third year was almost a 10% increase in performance, just flat out raw score performance. Uh, then for all students, including Latino and white students and other students, 64% of the parents with a child in public school reported that fights were a serious problem compared with only 30% of the parents in the uh, private schools. Uh, private school parents reported um, better learning conditions, 65% uh, to a much lower percentage in, in public schools. 64% of the students in private schools uh, regularly got homework of one hour or more, only 41% of students in public schools did. Uh, parents in private schools uh, reported almost uniformly very close communication with the school, and those in public school reported very little communication with the school. And uh, when asked to grade their schools, nearly 42% of parents in a private school gave the school an A, compared with less than 10% who gave a similar grade to, to the public schools. Now, that, that was a, the first comparison. You, you can go find ones that go either way, usually, usually geared to the bias of the person doing the report. You don't need reports. You don't need reports. You know that the public and private schools are better. Every parent knows it. That's why they want the kid in the public or private schools. So don't put up with the bull. Don't. Democratic teacher union preservation, as opposed to anything for the good of the child. Uh, if, they, if the private and parochial schools are so bad, well, then make them available and the parents won't select them. And the parents will take the kids out of private and parochial school. Now I will tell you something that's uniform in every single study that's been done here. The ones that are favorable, highly favorable or not so favorable to public, uh, private and parochial schools. In every situation where you set up a scholarship program, a voucher program, the public schools improve. Almost always. When the, uh, when the, when the scores uh, significantly improve like they did here by 10%, but they didn't improve for the Latino students, but they did for the black students. The public schools affected all improved. 
So when, when it reflects itself in better scores, or it doesn't, the public schools still improve. So what I originally thought about this 25 years ago has proven to be true. And it's not because I'm a genius, I just have common sense. Competition improves performance. Accountability improves performance. Don't measure teachers and you will go to a common denominator and that'll be mediocrity. Don't give children grades and the same thing will happen. If we want, if we want to get America back to an America that can compete with the rest of the world, as I said at the beginning, even if you have the means and the, and, 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 and the ability to put your child in a fine educational environment, whether it's pu private or public, because there are fine public schools, you've got to worry about the rest of the children. Of course you should as an altruistic matter and as a moral matter. I'm going to give you a practical reason why you should. Because the success of this country is not just going to rest on the performance of your child or the privileged children. It's going to rest on the performance of all the children. And your, ch your children are going to rise or fall with that as America rises or falls. This is, a, this is a solemn obligation you have. It's also a highly practical, patriotic obligation you have. So here's what I want to suggest to you. We are going to start over the next couple of weeks a freedom organization so that we fight to preserve the rights that are being taken away from us. At the core of that, in every election in this country, parental choice must be one of our major objectives. We have got to translate the 70% of African-American families who want choice into their voting against very often African-American politicians that represent them who, who do everything they can to destroy choice. Think of Barack Obama. His children went to private school. And when he became president, he opposed choice because he had to. He was the president of the United States, but the teachers union owned him. Joe Biden, I mean, you would expect him to do something corrupt. All of his kids went to parochial school. Oh, but your kids can't. Mm -mm. Only his privileged kids, because they could also commit crimes and get away with it. Your kids can't. Nancy Pelosi. Their, their feet have to be held to the fire. The pandemic showed us that even more than others in politics, these left-wing elites are thorough hypocrites. You know, you, you have to wear a mask, but they don't. Your children have to be in school for eight hours and have a mask on and snivel all over the place, but they can go to their highfalutin parties and they don't need a mask on. Look, look at Biden. He has his mask on out back. He has his mask on <coughs> when he's going to come out. He takes his mask off and he greets the person and spits in their face. What good did the mask do? You do that, and De Blasio wants to put you in prison. Except De Blasio has shown up all the time with, with. There was a time he was De Blasio was criticizing a group of Hasidic uh, people for, not, uh, for being too close to each other, even with masks on, too close to each other during a funeral. On a very same day, he took a picture with 300 teachers that supported him and none of them had masks on. Or how about the mayor of uh, Chicago in the middle of the pandemic? She was going to get her hair done when nobody else could go to hairdresser. And she said, well, I have to look good. This is what happens with schools. When it happens there, it's bad, but when it happens with children, it's catastrophic. They all put their children in safe, private schools, and they say to you, go to hell. You don't count. You're not part of the elite. You're just the, 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 the dregs who vote for us. And boy, we got you because we figured out how to manipulate you. So how about we 
we undertake a, an effort to separate and to educate and to get those parents, particularly African American and Hispanic, that are upwards of 60 to 70 percent in favor, let's get them to make that a single issue critical position that will determine their support for people who are not representing them, for people who are, who are, who are, who are claiming that they want to help the community. But I'll tell you, you cannot honestly be helping the African-American community if you're not for choice. You're selling the African-American community out for teacher union support. There's no question about it, because the single biggest issue in the African-American community is better education for the children. Single biggest issue in every community is better education for the children. And their parents want it. The other thing that happens, and this is what destroys the public schools, and why minority parents are so opposed to public schools, there's a racist attitude among the teachers union and the bureaucrats that minority parents don't care, poor parents don't care. They don't really have parents. And we have to be the parents. That's such an oversimplification. That's so racist. It's the reason they, it's the reason why they, they, they resort to charging everybody else with racism, because they are. Well, what about the 20,000 parents that took the time to make out the application? That took the time to reach into their wallets and come up with the money that was going to be necessary, even though they're poor to help their kids. They don't care about their kids. They may be poor. There's no monopoly on caring about your kids, whether you're wealthy or poor. How, how many of you grew up poor or relatively poor like I did and had parents that loved you tremendously and cared immensely about your education? Maybe more than the parents of rich kids. Where does this prejudice come from? Where does this racism come from? That attitude is prevalent in the public schools, and it separates the parents immediately from the teachers. And it may not be all the teachers, but it's the people who represent them. We've got to overcome that. We've got to overcome We've got to take advantage now of what Terry McAuliffe made a national issue, which is the uniform belief on the part of the education industry and the Democrat Party that parents don't belong in education. I mean, he said it, and the President of the United States came there and supported him. The former President of the United States came there and supported him. The Vice President of the United States came there and supported him. The First Lady came and supported him. And just about every frickin' Democrat from anywhere came to support him. Well, they didn't find anything wrong with that. And they're all practicing it in their own way. But we feel the opposite as, as Republicans and conservatives. We think par parental involvement maybe is the one critical element that'll really turn this around, and it's maybe the main element that's making public education so bad in America and having us fall behind other countries. So let's make this a central issue. Let's make this a, a, a do or die issue. You're either for choice or we're not going to vote for you. And we've got to educate our, 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 our friends and our brothers and sisters in different communities that is just as important for them as it is for us, because we're all in this together. We're going to stand or fall depending on how well we educate most Americans. And we don't want to fall. They do, but we don't. Because we want to remain a free country. We want to remain a country with the Bill of Rights. We want to remain a country where we can make our own choices about our personal life. We want to remain a country where a president has to persuade us and not dictate to us. Has to convince us rather than mandate us. And we want to stop now, immediately, the petty dictatorships that are beginning to grow up with Democrat governors and with this mentally challenged president. That's what we're going to dedicate ourselves to as part of this Freedom Network. But we're going to put a major focus on parental choice. So keep educating yourself about it. Give me as much information as you can about it. And we will go into much further detail in podcasts coming up very, very soon.
Thank you for paying attention. Please do, do some of your own research and background on this because I need your help. And God bless you and God bless America.